But there's a particular lady out in our audience that has a killer voice. And this last song, I was just standing up here, and I don't know who it is. And I guess I'm just going to say, if you're not from Hollywood, Florida, and that's you, you need to see Joey after the service. Because I even looked up at Joyce to see, is that Joyce? No, that wasn't Joyce singing. So somebody out there just has a, a, it's a lady who has a really good voice or a really high-pitched male who has a really good voice. So um, see Joy if you need to. We are, we are wrapping up a series today that we have been doing for three to four weeks now. And uh, we uh, I've enjoyed it. I, I, I hope you have gotten a lot out of it. Uh, I've been doing my walking in the morning, walking through our neighborhood and stuff. And, and these prayers I just keep repeating and sort of saying as I go. And, and it's really been incredible of what God has been teaching me personally um, through these prayers that we've been talking about. And so I hope that you've been taking advantage of that as well. Just to, to review as we wrap up, week one we, we talked about these dangerous prayers and, and week one was to pray, search me. Psalm 139 says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in my life that offends you and lead me on the path everlasting. Now that isn't a dangerous prayer because it's spooky or scary. It's a dangerous prayer because it could take you to a level with God that you've never experienced. In fact, here's what I would say. It will take you to a level you have never experienced unless you have prayed that very prayer. Search me, oh God. Week two we talked about the prayer, God sanctify me. And we looked in, we looked uh, in the Psalms and we, we looked at the verse that says, you are the potter, we are the clay. And I sort of made this up, make me more like Jesus today. That's a cute little prayer you could be teaching your children, um, as they grow up. One of those prayers that we talked about that day of, that they sort of grow up knowing. Last week we talked about the dangerous prayer of show me. God, show me my gifts, talents, and abilities. God, show me my spiritual gifts. God, show me that special gift that you have given me. And understanding that all of those things are to be put together for His glory and for His honor and for His name. And so many of us, if we would just be honest today, we use our gifts, talents, and abilities just for a paycheck. And we think that that is the goal, and we think that is the end-all, be-all, and and we think that that is uh, the epitome. But I'm here to tell you, God has a bigger purpose for your life than your paycheck. He has a a purpose for you in His kingdom as a believer. He has a purpose for you. And, And to accomplish that, He has created you uniquely and gifted you with gifts, talents, and abilities. He's given to each believer one special spiritual gift. To be used for His glory and for His name and for His kingdom. So it's sort of a dangerous prayer to say, God, show me those things. God, show me how to use those things. Some of you this week were, were here with Family Promise. And, and I know that there's some people, the way that they're made and the way that they're wired, they're sort of skittish about meeting strangers. They're sort of skittish about um, you know meeting some folks. But then I also know that there's some of you that just walk right in and grab a neck and act like you've known them for 100 years. I mean, but that's part of that creativeness. That's part of how God has created you. And each of us have been created uniquely, and each of us have been given a gift to be used. If you're part of our Vine family, each of you have been given a gift to be used here as a church to help His kingdom grow. The question with all three of these prayers is, will you pray them? Will you pray, God, search me? Will you pray, God, sanctify me? Will you pray, God, show me? And today we're going to end up this series with another, it's just a short two-word thing called uh, Dangerous Prayer Number 4 is Send Me. Send Me. Now, now if you got a bullet today, I'm just going to tell you, you got lucky. Because usually I have fill in the blanks, and this week I was in such a hurry that when I printed the bulletins, the answers are all in there. You ain't got to write a single thing down. There'll be a few verse references you may want to mark down, but, but basically all the answers are in the bulletin if you need them for today's message. But the, first, the, but the prayer is, God, send me. I want to make three simple statements this morning. And 
point out to us how crucial it is for us to pray this prayer God sent me. Here's the first point. God has always used people to spread His Word and spread His message. He has always used people. You look, if you read the Bible cover to cover, there are very few times where God just showed up and said specifically to them or to the nation of Israel, do this. He always used other people. I made a list here uh, of some of those things. Uh, God chose Adam and Eve to watch over his creation, to watch over the animals and, and all those things. God told Abraham to pick up and go to a land that he would show him. And he told Abraham, you will be the father of many nations. God told Noah to build an ark, to build a boat, to build an ark, and to tell the people that God was going to send a flood. And here's the incredible thing about that. He was telling the people that, and they had never even seen a drop of rain. But God sent Noah to send that message. God told Moses to, God told Moses to go and tell Pharaoh, oh, let my people go. <laughs> yeah, Lacey was at camp in 1980. Who else was at camp in 1980? <laughs> Right? Oh, was that wrong? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've had a long week. I've had a long week. Wow. Okay. Let's move on. God told, God told Moses and he sent Moses to take the Ten Commandments to the people, right? God didn't show up and put the Ten Commandments on the people. He used Moses to do it. He told Joshua to lead his people and tell them to obey his commands. He told Jonah, go to Nineveh. He sent Elijah to King Ahab. God has always used people like you and me to spread his message and spread his word. Now, you know, I, I have to admit that, that there was a generation of believers that grew up in the church thinking and hearing wrongly that if you were going to serve God, you had to be a missionary or a preacher or a pastor. But I'm here to tell you that God wants to send you where you're at to where you're going to who you're working with, to who you're with, to who you're around, to who you live next door to. And you don't have to be a missionary and you don't have to be a pastor or a preacher or a staff member because God wants to use us to send his message and send his word. Before Jesus was born, the Lord sent John to do what? Prepare the way. Jesus sent the disciples. The disciples sent the apostles. The apostles sent Paul. And Paul sent many others. And on and on and on and on it went. And guess what? The gospel got to you. How? Because God sent people to spread His word and spread His message. And you're here today because someone prayed the prayer, send me. Could have been your Sunday school teacher. Could have been your parent. Could have been, could have been uh, your teacher in school. It could have been someone at vacation Bible school. I don't know who it was for you. But someone had prayed the prayer, send me. And God used them to bring the gospel message to you. So God has always used people. Not perfect people. Not without flaws. Not without failings. But God has always used people. To spread his message and spread his word. Here's the second statement. God is looking for those who will pray, send me. He's looking. He is on the lookout today. He is on the lookout for those that would pray, God, send me. Listen to Isaiah 6 in chapter 8. It says, Then I heard the Lord asking, Whom shall I send as a messenger to this people? And who will go for us? And Isaiah said, I, and he said, Here I am, send me. You see, God didn't strong arm him into going. God didn't force him and push him, but he was looking. And today God isn't going to strong arm you into going. He isn't going to strong arm you. He isn't going to push you into going. But today he's looking for folks who would pray, Lord, send me. In the book of Acts, Jesus was preparing to go back to heaven. 
And we know it as the Great Commission. He said, you will be my witnesses. You will receive power and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost. And today God is looking for some folks who would pray, send me. Send me to my neighbor. Send me to my co-worker. Send me to my students, for those of you that are teachers. Send me to, to the people at the base, for those of you that work at the base. Send me, God. Send me. God is looking for those who will pray. God, send me. And here's the third statement today. Very simple statements. God has the field ready for harvest. God has the field ready for harvest. Can I tell you today that there's probably somebody in your circle that is ready for harvest. They're just waiting for someone to say, send me. Maybe your coworker, maybe a family member, maybe uh, someone on your street, maybe someone on your ball team, maybe someone in your class, maybe a friend or a buddy, whoever it might be, there's probably somebody in your circle that's ready for harvest. And God's just waiting for you to say, send me. John chapter 4, uh, verse 35, 38 says, You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest. But I say, wake up and look around. The field's already ripe for harvest. It's already ready. The harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. You know the saying, one plants and another one harvests, and it's true. I set you to harvest where you did not plant. Others had already done the work, and now you will get, and now you will get to gather the harvest. Can I tell you, in a few weeks, some of you are going to have the opportunity to harvest a seed that was maybe planted two, three years ago. Vacation Bible School in the United States is the most evangelistic outreach, the most evangelistic tool used in the United States. More children and even adults come to know Christ through a week of Vacation Bible School throughout the United States than in, than in any other thing that's done throughout the entire year. And some of you have served several years, and some of you have planted seeds years ago that are now getting ripe for harvest. Some of you are going to have the opportunity to harvest some seeds that week. It wasn't, it wasn't a seed that you planted. It wasn't a seed that you watered. But the, the, the harvest is ripe, and you're going to get the opportunity to go and harvest for God. But would you pray, God send me because there's some when they hear vacation bible school they run the other way but there are seeds that have been planted year after year after year and some of them are very ripe in fact the last several weeks you've seen people be baptized that were saved at vacation bible school and it wasn't that that just happened in a one-day scenario. Those are seeds that were planted and watered and harvested. And last week and the couple weeks before that, we got to celebrate with those children and their families of the harvest of their souls for God. The harvest is ready. The seeds have been planted. The seeds have been watered. The harvest is ready. But God's looking for some folks who will say, God, send me. In Matthew chapter 9, it says this. He said to his disciples, The harvest is great. See, what determine what defines great? Well, the Bible says that when one person comes to repentance, accepts Jesus Christ as their Savior, that the angels rejoice. That there is a party in heaven that goes on. There is a, a shouting fit that goes on up in heaven. When one person comes, because I think here's what some of us do. We think, if it's not a hundred, I'm not getting involved. 
And if it's not 100 people accepted Christ, then I'm not going to be there. But the Bible says the harvest is great, and the harvest could be that one person this year that accepts Christ at Vacation Bible School. Now, it may be 5, or it may be 10, or it may be 15 or 20, but maybe just one. And he says the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest and ask Him to send more workers into the field. Let me just ask you a question this morning. Would you be willing to do a little bit of work in the field? Would you be willing, and I understand all of you have other jobs that you're going to work 8 to 5 that week. For some of you, you're going to drive directly from work and come here for vacation Bible school that week. I understand you're going to be tired in the evenings when you go home. I understand all the scenarios and all the reasons and, and all of the 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 excuses or, or, or whatever you you have. I get it. I understand all of that. But we need some workers in the field. Because the field's ripe for harvest. It's ready for picking. I know Dustin does a lot of farming, and I, and I was hoping Mr. Kyle was going to be here, but Dustin does a lot of farming too. And I know that, that as a farmer, there's a lot of toil and trouble and pain and work that goes into cultivating, planting, watering, cultivating, picking. We, but when it comes time for the harvest... And I've never been with Dustin when he does it or Mr. Kyle when they do it, but I'm sure when you go out with the truck or the tractor and you work all day, but you come back with the harvest, there's this feeling that is almost inexplainable. Tucker's been on the tractor. Caitlin's been on the tractor for that matter. Marissa, you've been on the tractor? Marissa's been on the tractor. If you want to get on a tractor, you guys somehow marry into that family. But, <laughs> but when they go out into the field for harvest, they don't remember the pain. They don't remember the days of, of, of the work and the toil and the trouble. But there's a feeling inside of them that says, this is the harvest. But before there's ever a harvest, somebody has to go into the field. Now I want to talk just one minute to our Vine family. Because on the back table, there's a sign-up sheet for spots. And on the back table, and again, I know every reason you could give me for why you wouldn't sign up, but on the back table, there's a bunch of empty spots and slots that need to be filled. Now, Carnegie isn't paying me for this, I'm just telling you. But I'm telling you that God's looking for a handful of folks that will say, God, send me that week. Send me that week into the life of a little child. Send me that week into the life of that one kid. We always have one kid that, that, that like his mama drops him off in the door and runs. I mean, she's like, you got him for two hours, I'm out. I mean, we always have that one kid. And for years, Steve Caldwell was, his, was that kid's mentor. And Steve Caldwell would walk around with him from everywhere that kid went. Steve was with him. Maybe we need somebody to, to help that one kid this year. Maybe we need some folks that will work with our three and four year olds and our kindergartners and our first and second graders. We need some of you that will play games and do crafts and prepare food. We need some of you that will teach songs. We need workers in the field. And I'm here to tell you that the biggest harvest in the life of this church in 2016 will be the week of June 13th through the 17th. But I'm here to tell you we need workers in the field. And the question today that I'll end on is this. Who will pray, send me? Who will pray, send me? Let's pray.